had a question for um, um, for Jim, actually, um, which is that, um, of course, you mentioned targeting new antigens. I was wondering, um, in any particular tumor, um, what proportion of the T cell response is directed against new antigens? Is that known? In the tumors that we have looked at, I can only tell you for the CD8 T cells, most of the CD4s are probably helper T cells, but some probably have some antigen specificity. It's about half. Now, those are patients that are responding. And so if you looked at um, baseline prior to therapy, um, my guess is it's a much smaller number, maybe of just a couple percent. Sui. Yeah, it's a question also to Jim. Uh, you know, a lot of mutations are, that can be used as neoantigen are not driving mutations. And so it's easy for cells to downregulate them. And I, I think that could be a challenge, right? And uh, how do you plan to address that? Oh, so I think your question relates to the fact that you can have neoantigens from proteins that are not essential for cell function. And so the cell just quits regulate, quits that function as a way of escape, which is what's called um, immune editing. Is that your question? So I think the way you do that is that you use half a dozen. You don't just choose one. I think if you're going to base a therapy on this kind of thing, I think any single antigen or any single T cell receptor, unless it's accompanied by a very aggressive epitope spreading, is likely to do immune editing. Um, but that's OK. You know, you can pick a half a dozen and, um, and go forward that way. That's my, I think right now for low mutation burden tumors, that's going to be very tough to do. But as our algorithms get better, as we feed more data to those algorithms, we will be able to make those predictions more effectively. I would be interested in knowing um, now how the panel would define the, uh, the title of this session, Scalar Technologies, and how it applies across the three topics that you've presented to us today. I think they're, they're definitely vectorized technologies, right? <laughs> I, I think it means scalable. Scalable. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I, I think it does mean scalable from the, from the point of view that it can be scaled to the immune system or it can be scaled to looking at ocean systems, essentially, um, if that answers your question. Yeah, I had the same question. <laughs> <laughs> Now I answered it, <laughs> finally. I don't think there is a bigger scale than that, is there? Uh, so all three of you today talk about rare population of cells or even single cells that can have the response of some of the clinical phenotypes we see. Uh, my question is like still, it is a, a collective response, our physiology of all these unique events that you can see or when we talk to the ocean about the unique different uh, um, functions in the microorganism. So my question is um, how we can, do you have any ideas moving forward essentially how we need to collect information to translate all these emergent technologies to the clinic or understand more higher levels of organization? Maybe you could expand your question a little bit. Okay. I was not maybe clear. Um, so essentially how by uh, finding how individual cells are working or for example then like very rare information we need to assemble in order to have a, um, a translational tool, how to say, for the cleaning, essentially how a patient is going to respond. You have found, for example, this neoantigen and you have created a vaccine. How you know it's going to respond if those are the correct ones or not? 
for example, for you, Jim? I think these are very early days yet. I can take a best guess. Yes. Um, so my best guess is that these cellular, that these rare cellular popula populations are also the best biomarkers of therapeutic response or failure. Um, I also believe that, I mean, that's a very simple question, OK? If I showed a piece of data early on in my talk looking at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and their functional performance right after the start of PD-1 therapy. Um, and so these were also rare cells. It was a, 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 about 1,000 cells that were analyzed. If you looked at those functions, they were not tumor killing. They were all recruiting other immune cells, which is probably why there's that lag time before a response. So I think with something like the immune system, where my teacher of immunology is here in the room, it's Alan. So if I say something wrong, I'm get slapped on the wrists. I thought you were going to pass that on to me to answer. <laughs> and he's going to now tell you the answer to that question. <laughs> I'll take a shot, but tell me what you think. Um, so I think with the immune system, we actually have a pretty reasonable insight into when you have a cell and it has a certain functional performance, what that implies. It implies replication, inflammation, um, what have you. And so I think as we get better at understanding these rare cell populations, where they are physiologically, what their functional performance is, we will all that is telling you much, much more about how to make these therapies work. So I think it, it, almost everything we see, one can think about a clinical translation of that knowledge. Whether it translates into a therapy or whether it translates into understanding how patients respond or don't respond, I don't know. But I, you almost can't avoid it right now. It's such a rich, rich area. Yeah, I, I'll just chime in a little, a little bit more on that one. Um, so like in the two, immune profiling talks, uh, you know, those are really, or a big part of them is focused on discovering interactions, uh, neoantigens or receptors, whatever else. That's one, one side of it. But the integration of data side, I think Jim rightly pointed towards the, the functional profiling of the cells and uh, understanding how various cell types in both time and space are communicating and orchestrating each other. And I, I think it's not more complicated than knowing that in any population of cells at any given time, there are different cells sending different cytokines, interacting with each other. And I think this will, you know, that kind of data informs on targets and informs on how, what the pathways actually are and how to intervene with them. And I think that, um, you know, the, the ability to look at populations that are not synchronized and see what's happening within a cell and the ability to look at populations that are not functionally, um, I won't say equivalent, but similar, uh, those, those two levels of detail I think are needed for a lot of these, a lot of these mechanisms. And immunology is a great example of that. Um, so. so question here in the back for Gare. Um, one of the things that we begin to appreciate in numbers of microbes over the last few years is uh, the capacity to process very large amounts of um, nutrients, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on through the oceans. And you know, while we have to study at a single cell level how these microbes function, they do work in communities. And microbial ecology is, for the first time, now tractable at a single cell level and also at scale. And I, th I think that's exciting. But what are your thoughts in terms of the 99% of microbes that cannot be cultured either because they're dependent on each other uh, or live in conditions that we don't fully understand? And, with environmental context, could your technology help in getting over some of these challenges in culturing these microbes? Yeah, I would. I would hope so. I mean, I mean, this is why why we start this. And what I like about the Hawaiian system is that it's so simple. You know, at least we think it's simple because we can only re recognize two or three of of the major players, or there seem to be only two or three major players. But what we hope to do in the end is to be able to synthesize these three players into a real community. How are they interact? What are the responses? What are the mechanisms that they specialize in? 
and then maybe apply that to the more complex places like the Arctic and, and the coast of uh, Peru. But yeah, you're right. We're <clears throat> it's a little um, a little ambitious to think that we we can understand how communities work by by studying the individuals. Um, but we at least need to have an indication of who's there. But then we also have to have effective methods of coming in and measure how the community functions as a whole. And uh, you have one of the nice systems that uh, with, the, with the Methanobacter and the Disofo, where you actually see that that role play, or the, the roles that these organisms play is not always fixed, that they have a, a flexibility and can assign each other roles and then form a, a more per perfect uh, community. So yeah, I think that's very important. Can I, uh, can I address a question? I have a mic here in front of me. So I, I want to switch slightly the perspective on, these, on this question. This, um, this morning I've been just overly impressed, maybe to the extent that I should have come in better prepared with the extreme development of the technology that's allowing us to interrogate the immune system at levels that uh, if you're not in this field, you probably didn't fully understand. It's truly remarkable what you've shared with us this morning. So I'd like to shift a, a little bit into the other side of the equation, which relates to this uh, autoimmune spectrum of diseases, which we are seeing with increasing frequency in our society. And there's a big uh, question about why, where it's coming from, and what, what's the nature of these conditions. When in medical school, we learned that these uh, immune responses were to single and double-stranded DNA. The, the suggestion was that these were intact native forms of DNA. But as you all have helped us to understand, when we start to interrogate at a greater degree of specificity, maybe we are looking at other than native forms of, of antigenic determinants uh, that then relate to an immune response. So I'd like to, knowing that I'm kind of deflecting the conversation slightly, get your opinion about how what you're learning helps to uh, unearth our better understanding of the etiology of autoimmune disease. Okay, um, so I suppose the, the, the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, it's been in human patients very difficult to come up with, uh, at least on the antibody side, and probably even more so on the T cell side, to identify immunogenic epitopes and autoimmune disease. I mean, that's been a tricky thing to do, and it's been tricky to connect it also with uh, with the actual antibody sequences. And there are some diseases, for instance, that we know there are big Antibody, uh, antibody responses in, and yet we found very few targets. Like MS is an example where there's been very little done. Um, so I think as, you know, largely driven by immuno-oncology, as these technologies are pushed to have more throughput and more precision, uh, it opens up opportunities to better dissect just what's driving that. Um, and so, that, you know, that's, I, I think there, there's hope that we're going to have a much better understanding of that in the near future. And certainly everything we're learning from immuno-oncology in terms of manipulating T cells and NK cells and macrophages and dendritic cells and the million different cell types that exist, if you believe a cell type is really a thing. Um, all of this, I, I think, is going to put some, some color on it. And Alan's got his hand up, so he should definitely say something. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll add to that from a different perspective. Um, much of the conversation here has been about the the um, the inducing side of autoimmunity with respect to antibodies, with respect to uh, the various changes that happen, so that self is recognised. But the other half of this is the effector mechanisms. So, for example, we know that if you could interrogate properly um, inflammatory cells that are circulating um, in the blood, you would have a very good chance, I think, of discovering the effective mechanisms that are induced by the autoimmune insults as they begin. One good example of that is TNF, tumor necrosis factor, which in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, um, I mean, Enbrel, which is an antagonist to TNF, resulted in Amgen squandering $16 billion on Immunex. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very effective drug. It's a, <coughs> al almost... Um, almost a miracle drug. And that you can tell from looking at the, using exactly the same technology that was described here and uh, looking at the effector cells as opposed to the ones that 
cause the initial lesions. Yeah. Okay, my turn? Okay. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Heath. Um, <clears throat> In, in your talk, you, you showed a graph where you saw increased mutational baggage in a tumor and correlated that to an increased chance of that tumor being successfully treated with immunotherapy. And I understand the connection between, you know, increased mutational baggage and increased infiltrating lymphocytes, thereby making those tumors more susceptible to neoantigen treatments. But I also see how increased mutational baggage could completely change the landscape of a cell surface repertoire, thereby making those tumors less effectively treated by immunotherapies. So, um, you know, with that in mind, do you think that there's another area beyond mutational baggage with which to look at tumors and say, ooh, that cancer would be a good one to think about for immunotherapy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think if you look at the well, it's, so when you look at T cells that are in a tumor, you, um, you would like to know why they're there, okay? So some of them may just be spectators, some may be helpers, some may have been called in there from some specific reason for the tumor. The ones that are there specifically because they're trying to attack the tumor whether they're shut down or not, those cells probably have upregulated checkpoint markers <laughs> because they're being turned off. And so I think if you want to understand, let's take a very hard to treat tumor, um, it could be that we simply don't know the checkpoints. And so these very rare cell types can be mined to identify exactly what checkpoints you want to block to enable that patient to respond. Um, but I think it does come down to, you know, if you did this randomly for T cells in the tumor, you're, gonna, you're never going to figure out anything. You need to do a very, very specific profiling. Um, but I think the information content is, is we're just tapping it. And we're just beginning to understand the simplest, crudest things. I mean, the simplest, crudest thing is that find a T cell that's going to attack a tumor and make more of it. That's what we're saying. But there's much more to, to do um, with the deeper analysis of these populations. I mean, I, I'll just maybe add to that that uh, you know, there is an immense focus on T cells, but they're not the only cells, right? So. What about dendritic cells? What about NK cells? What about, you know, what about tumors that have downregulated MHC? So T cells probably won't work so great. Um, what about the other cell types? Uh, I, I think people are picking up on that, but it's pretty early, right? So 200 meters down off of Hawaii, what's the flux of photons per organism? At that 200 point? meters, it's, um, well, the light intensity is 0.1% there. Okay. I don't know what the flux is per organism, but then you need also the absorption, cross-section cross of the molecules. Uh, I'm just wondering whether it made sense that organisms, you know, that at that energy input level, they could, they could survive at that level. Whether it's uh, generally accepted that uh, it pays up to 100 meters deep to be photosynthetically active. So okay. the ones that are living between 100 and 200 meters probably have alternative ways. Ah, do we know? Ways. No. No? Okay. So is there a genomic difference? But although they may be waiting to be welled up in well a storm up, yeah. or something. Okay. I, I actually think they're in a... In a Quiescent state or something? Like that? Yeah, just a resting phase. And so is there a known genomic difference between the surface members of the population and the 100 you meters You find deep? all four clades at between 100 and 200 meters in about equal numbers. But is there, is there a... Uh, you know, are the ones that are deeper, better... Does their genome show that they've got adaptive? Well, they, they, can, they can select where they are going to hang out. The, the right, I understand. So, so, um, so you, it's, it's all, in my view, it's impossible for them to adapt to that environment because right. they're there by accident. And whatever environment they are adapted to probably needs more light and, and they need to be welled up during a storm or something in order to, to proliferate and then go down yep. with the in a passive manner to these deeper things. But, but <clears throat> the, 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 the thinking about it is not well developed at all. If you, if you ask oceanographers, they really haven't thought that much about how, how these algae distribute themselves over, over these layers. Max. 
Thank you. This question's for the um, one on the on the left there, from my perspective. Your left, me. Sorry, my left. <laughs> oh, God. Um, have you thought about trying to apply your your uh, uh, microfluidics to um, making tumor specific uh, detectors? So, for example, I'm thinking maybe if you had a, a person who has melanoma, and uh, so you could easily get a tumor sample and a, a normal sample, uh, finding um, uh, a marker, you know, marker antibodies uh, for that, so that they could know how much of the skin to, to excise. Uh, so y yes, we have. We've even done some some experiments along that that vein. Um, I think it's quite interesting. So when when hybridoma technology was first invented 40 years ago, people weren't looking for antibodies. They were looking for antigens. They were looking for tumor specific antigens. They would immunize with tumors, and then they would counter-screen antibodies against normal cells and tumor cells. Um, and that's how a lot of the tumor-specific antigens were found. Uh, and that kind of passed away when we got into the era of genomics. Uh, but I, I would say that you know, the immune system, in addition to uh, you know, being good at making reagents and, and finding the antigen with the reagent in, in one shot, also recognizes all kinds of things you'll never see with genomics, uh, you know, post-translational modifications, glycosylations, everything else. And technologies that have now brought, like we can screen five million cells, that, that has brought hybridoma you know, forward uh, three or four orders of magnitude in speed and, and uh, throughput. I, I think it's, it's very conceivable, particularly if you go to other species as well, where we haven't combed over all the antibodies. We've, we've done that pretty well with mice, but what about dogs? What about you know, um, going to different libraries and with higher throughput? I think it's a really interesting prospect that you could use natural immune systems to find novel antigens. Um, and of course, the beauty of it is that when you do it, you've got the reagent in hand. And, and for things like you know, immunohistochemistry and such, it'd be quite interesting. We, just ha we haven't had time to pursue that, but that's been kicked around. I actually wrote a grant, and uh, uh, DOD hated it, so I didn't, I didn't get money for it. <laughs> we have one at the back. A question for uh, Jim and, and Carl. So, so you know, in the uh, you both talk about isolating T cell subtypes from tumor and, and to guide uh, therapies. Uh, so, I was wondering, are there any effort that you try to capture the uh, the interacting partners of these T cells, or you know, to preserve the spatial information in solid tumor to identify new targets? Um, I'll take a sh shot at that. So. In principle, our method is amenable to doing the entire analysis in an intact tumor. The challenge is that as soon as you fix the tumor, all your peptide MHC molecules fall apart. And so you have to do it on very freshly resected tumor. And we started doing that. And the goal is that you can actually see what is clonally expanded in the tumor. As which tells you something about immunogenicity. Um, and I think just the more you can image the physiological environment, the more you're going to learn. So um, we can't do that yet, but, um, but we have early data that says it should be possible. Um, and I think it's a very valuable uh, direction to go into. Yeah, maybe I'll just add. No. Oh, uh, just a little bit more. Um, so I think in the T cell side, there's you know, two important problems, and Jim hit one of them, which is what is everything reacting to? What are, what are the antigens? And then once you have the antigens, what's the T cell? And fishing that out, and those are sort of complementary. Um, I'm, I'm quite curious to see how mass spec approaches also come forward in terms of you know, determining uh, MHC presentation and what peptides are actually there. Uh, and I think it's still early days for that, but you can imagine that it's not just going to be the types of technologies we talked about. There's going to be genomic methods layered on this and proteomic, and um, I think that's all going to come together in ways that we necessarily can't or that we may not be able to predict right now. Um, Rob? Go ahead. Where do the T cells come from? I mean, this is all based on a premise that there are T cells and the T cells are prevented from going after the tumor because of checkpoints and things like that. But of course, the process of making the T cell that is prepared to go after the tumor, if 
there were no checkpoint inhibitors, says they came from somewhere. And where did they come from? What, what's the basis? The thymus. The, the thymus. No, I know, but <laughs> they, they came from evolution, no, but passing by the details. What, what, what process is producing the stuff that goes into the APC and leads to the cascade that generates eventually a, a T cell that is focused in that direction? Well, the, the T cells have come through combinatorial recombination of BD, BDJ and other genes, and then counter selection for recognition of self. So you, you have to get lucky that you've got one that recognizes so, it. So I mean, you're saying it's just random motion that's, that's there? Well, it's not, people have shown it's not perfectly random, but it's highly stochastic, let's say that. But is that rather than, than tumor cell death by some other mechanism or by weak interaction with some other T cell that isn't enough to kill off a major part of well, the tumor? Well, the, the fundamental clones need to be there, but then they will respond in the context of random cell death and inflammation, and you know, they need to get triggered. I, I, mean, I think it's probably a little more deterministic than that, but I don't know, because you, a tumor is in many ways like an open wound, right? Mm -hmm. And so you do have innate mm -hmm. immune cells that are there that are chewing up stuff and presenting antigen, and they float away. And so there is some recruitment that happens at a site through such actions like that. We also have, you know, tumors are often, they have necrotic parts to them, and right. there are parts in which cells are dying for who knows what reason, inflammation that's nonspecific and anoxia around the edges of the tumor mass. But the question is, do you have to have that? I ask it because it raises the question of whether you, in fact, want to do another one of those non-intuitive things of doing something that would seem to damage cells non-specifically in order to Absolutely. generate fragments that, that Absolutely. you would go after. I think that is, without question, uh, one of the ways people are thinking about how to get a, a non-responsive tumor to generate, a, to catalyze an immune response. Absolutely. So you have... Physical damage, you have radiation. What else could you do to generate a lot of pieces that would start generating um, T cells directed toward that repertoire? Chemotherapy. Chemo, Chemo, you can starve them of, you know, there's glycolysis inhibitors that cause right. massive cell death, but perhaps cancer cells tend to want to die a little more than healthy cells. Right. Um, so there's some very non selective approaches one could do to catalyze. So if you titrated them correctly. And, and there are clinical trials where people are doing a much more, you know, uh, deliberate approach where they're injecting viruses, you know, that encode CMV mm -hmm. peptides and they're deliberately um, applying a molecular adjuvant to these things. With, with, and, and a lot of the therapies we had, in fact, if you look back, they kind of worked that way. So we may end up concluding that much of what has been conventional wisdom in, in tumor treatment is, in fact, counterproductive. Or it's been working for reasons that we didn't understand when it or, does work. Or not working for or reasons. Or not working for reasons, reasons. Right. exactly. Okay. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, is there any evidence that um, under conditions of chemotherapy, there is more access to these new antigens or that they're presented to a greater extent on antigen presenting cells? Well, chemotherapy tends to install a genetic instability in tumors, for one thing, and tumor killing. Uh, radiation is typically thought of as the way to expose a tumor to something like the immune system. Mm -hmm. And there is evidence uh, that in the context of radiotherapy, you would have more of these antigens presented to the immune system? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's a little sketchy because, I mean, you saw the state of the art in antigen measurement just now, mm -hmm. and there's not much, not much known out there. but. You know, I was on a stand-up to cancer review panel for pancreatic cancer a year ago. And there you have this problem in that um, the pancreas has a, the tumor has a bit of a sheath around it. And everybody was trying to promote tumor killing via radiation. Every single proposal that came in, they were all immunotherapy proposals. And they all started with, let's loosen up that, that, that sheath. And now whether that's a good strategy or not, you know, maybe it's like lemmings going over a cliff. It's just everybody says it's a good idea and that's what they do, but it, it made sense. Rob. So this is a question for all three of you, and if you could probably answer them separately. It's more got to do with um, cost and translation. And I think um, each, of, each of you have got um, different technologies that you're applying to a different answer. 
But I think one of the questions that we always ask is, is what is that end cost going to be per assay or per identification? So, Gare, I suppose for, for you would be, this would be continual measurements that would need to be taken to understand the health of the oceans and, and uh, what that cost would be given the current technology that you have and can you see it getting cheaper? And for Jim, I suppose it's, it's to look at the, the cost of identification of these um, rare uh, events that are occurring for um, identification of the T cells and the T cell receptors. And, and finally, um, for Carl, be with the scale that you have in the microfluidics <coughs> and the, the scalar component of being unlimited, trying to, trying to push that through, can you see your cost in identification of antibodies getting to a point where it's cheaper to do that than what you can currently do by you know, other methods? Well, um, let me start. Uh, I, th I think it's <clears throat> useless to talk about cost if you don't talk about benefit. And right now what I'm doing doesn't have much benefit, so it's too costly anyway. And that's what we call it research. <clears throat> um, if research shows that it's good for something, then it often doesn't matter how expensive uh, an approach is. So, so comparing the cost of, of a novel technology to an existing one already shows you that the new technology hasn't anything to go for it and you're only going by price. That's not what scientists do. We should, we should develop better technologies irrespective of cost, show their usability, their utility, and then we hope that the engineers after us will make them cheaper and make them affordable to everyone. But the real crux is that we have to prove utility first. And in my case, actually, I haven't done that yet. Yeah, so I'll answer this question too, because it's an, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, so in the analysis that we do, if we looked at 20 different patients, we would see 20 different sets of neoantigens. And we'd be lucky if one of them overlapped one and neoantigen, not one patient. And so taking that to its logical conclusion, you would say you have to analyze everybody separately. You're developing separate um, uh, vaccines or separate T-cell th therapies. Okay, and that's about the dumbest approach to thinking about that problem I can come up with. The reason why, and this is something that Lee has taught us all, is that you know, technology advances exponentially, even though we tend to think linearly. So let's say what happens is that we identify these T cells as telling us the best checkpoints. Then suddenly we have an incredible treasure trove of T cells, but it's one common drug. Or let's say that we are able to use this data sets we develop to develop terrific MHC prediction, uh, antigen prediction algorithms. So we no longer have to do the measurements, which is not so ridiculous. Um, and in which case, you know, you rely on the technologies of Juno and Kite and Novartis, who are already dead set on, on developing cell-based therapies. So I think if you just look linearly, I agree. Um, but it's research. And, um, and, and the more you find out, the better you're equipped to solve a problem. And you, you're always going to take the most efficient way to solve that problem. Uh, me, I guess. Um... So how does, I, I would say that, that the way that tech, our technology is right now, um, it's already much cheaper on a per antibody basis than any other approach to generate antibodies. Uh, there are cases where you don't care about getting a great antibody and it's pretty immunogenic. You could do an hybridoma for a couple thousand bucks uh, and then you should. Um, but in cases where you're looking for something that's high performance uh, and we're having multiple candidates or where you're going after a target that's difficult, um, I think it's already there, and I think it's going to get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, by far, the dominant cost right now is, is labor and time associated with expression and, and characterization downstream. The discovery is now very quick, and uh, when done at scale, you know, there, is, there is some next generation sequencing, but you amortize that across a few hundred antibodies, it ends up being a few dollars per antibody. So uh, from a cost of goods perspective, it's, it's not a lot. Um, from a labor and technology perspective, um, from a labor perspective, um, it's still, we still have challenges on the downstream expression and characterization. Um, and I think that there are good solutions to that. They're industrialized 
robotics and you know, I don't think you need to be really innovative, you just have to uh, get mechanized uh, to do it well. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. So a big thank you to our speakers. Many thanks for your questions.